why are bees important? What do they contribute to the ecosystem? And why are their numbers declining? We will give you the answers in today's show. Here on Eco Africa, we focus on nature and the environment. Hello and welcome. I'm Neota Igwe in Ibadan, Nigeria. Hi, Niyota. It is good to be with you all again today. I am Sandra Twinovdia here in the capital city of Uganda. It is not just bees that will keep us busy. Here are some of the topics on today's show. A farmer in Ivory Coast who has switched to organic and sustainable methods. Two young environmental activists in South Africa who have set up a recycling operation and bushmeat. Our last stop today is in Nigeria where we visit a market for wild and rare animals despite a ban on the trade. But first, we head to Ivory Coast. Monocultures are bad for biodiversity. And over many years, large cocoa plantations there have ravaged local ecosystems that, coupled with deforestation, soil degradation made worse by climate change, and population growth means things have to change. Daniel Ulai is a farmer who has switched to organic sustainable methods. He has adopted the principle known as permaculture and he has also inspired hundreds of others to follow. Let us go and meet him. The city of Man in the mountains of Western Ivory Coast. It's a largely agricultural region and farmer Daniel Olai also works as a trainer for young cultivators here. But today he's picking up some tips himself about crossbreeding plants and limiting the use of pesticides. He's come to an experienced farmer for advice. When they use pesticides, the vegetables grow like crazy and the farmers make more money. But when the products get to the market, two or three days later, they start to rot. Daniel is interested in learning more about the natural techniques used in the past. He observes carefully. Today I'm the one who's at school. The idea here is to learn from an experienced person about some of the older practices. Today they have either been abandoned or they are still being used, but in a different way. Daniel Olai has begun to collect seeds which haven't had contact to chemical pesticides. Whenever he meets with the older farmers, he asks them for seeds. Today the situation is clear. These seeds are threatened. They are about to disappear, to be lost. That's why it's important to save them because they have an important role in safeguarding our biodiversity. After asking around, Daniel Olai was able to gather 17 seed types. He tested the seeds on his experimental farm to find the best varieties. His father was surprised and displeased by Daniel's choice of profession. Ernest Olai doubted that his son could make a living as a farmer. Being a breeder, being a farmer, that was unfamiliar terrain to me. So I wasn't at all happy. I didn't encourage him. I have to be honest, I didn't encourage him at all. Today the father is proud of his son's work and that Daniel also convinces others to follow his examples. The 31-year-old decided to launch his own training sessions to teach other farmers how to stop using chemical pesticides. Ivorian agriculture is suffering these days. Pesticides have damaged the soil. Young people are leaving the farms, convinced that they cannot earn enough in the sector. Those who think that you cannot make a living as a farmer, that you cannot make a lot of money, those are people who are not really trying to develop their business. And before this instruction, that was a problem we all had. Daniel Olai wants the local farmers to make their crops more commercially viable. In Danane, a community a few kilometers away, 
he helps women farmers to market their organic rice. The most consumed rice in Ivory Coast is imported. Ivorian consumers are strongly dependent on their rice, which comes from Asia, from China or Thailand. Our objective today is to be able to propose a local rice produced by women under organic conditions. Not only rice, Ivory Coast imports many other foods in large quantities, although they could be grown here. Here the women are preparing to set the rice seedlings. First they apply compost to enrich the soil. There is a new sense of optimism among these organic farmers. They hope to do better than growers did in the past. In the past, when my parents produced rice and brought it to the market, they didn't have a lot of buyers. It wasn't easy. They often had to sell the rice more cheaply. Daniel Olai has already found a store in Abidjan that will sell the women's rice. He believes that if he can make locally grown crops more popular, maybe more young people will consider staying in the region to cultivate the fields. Farming can only go well if the ecosystem is healthy and in most places that means having lots of insects and bees. Bees are super important as pollinators, helping countless species of plants to reproduce. Bees transport pollen from flower to flower. If that doesn't happen, the plants can't keep going. That's right Sandra, but in many countries like in Europe and elsewhere, bee colonies have been dying at an alarming rate. Pesticides, disease and monocultures are among the culprits. In Germany, hobby beekeepers are stepping up their efforts to keep the pollinators alive and buzzing. Let's see this. Every morning, more dead bees can be found lying in front of these hives, the pride and joy of amateur beekeeper Fritz Klarholz. Worker bees normally live for six weeks, but his are falling victim to a parasite brought into Europe from Asia. Varroa mites destroy the bees' nervous system to a point where they lose their sense of orientation. That means they're unable to carry out their tasks anymore. They even lose their ability to fly. That's why the Varroa mite is very, very dangerous for bees. Fritz Klarholz is one of around 100,000 amateur beekeepers in Germany. He and his wife took up the hobby five years ago in Berlin. The number of beekeepers has risen in recent years. And in lots of German cities, including the capital, there are many different bee colonies living within an area of only a few square kilometers. That makes for a certain density, but the bees, as they are now, are able to cope. They aren't starving. To make sure the bees do cope, the amateur apiarists are helped by a veterinarian at Berlin's Free University. Dr. Benedikt Polacek gives regular courses on amateur beekeeping. He also instructs master beekeepers at the university. His students learn all about the different types of bee. There are more than 560 species in Germany alone, most of them wild. Wild and solitary bees spend their lives alone. They don't live in colonies. So they're exposed to different dangers. Honeybees have the infamous parasite, the varroa mite, but not solitary bees. Instead, solitary bees have the problem of nesting sites. Monocultures don't provide nesting sites. We really need more, smaller fields, and we need chemical-free fields. Studies from Europe and the US show that monocultures and pesticides are the main threats to bees' survival. With not a single chemical in tow, biologist Corinna Hölzer plants an array of native flowers in residential areas in Berlin. The project is funded by Germany's Environment Ministry. Wild bees only feed on certain flowers. The more diverse the garden, the more bees that can thrive here. 
We don't have enough spaces for flowers in the countryside and in cities, but we have to help them all. It's not about honeybees versus wild bees. It's equally bad for all insects. Without bees, nature is missing one of its most vital pollinators. They're responsible for the propagation of hundreds of thousands of plants. Corinna is hoping to encourage more people in the countryside and the cities to get planting. Calm, clean and beautiful environment you have here. Now, it's not always the situation, but you see, the funny thing is that when ordinary people take the initiatives, the results can be surprising and great. Here, as you can see, it's quite clean. But another example is from South Africa. An estimated 90% of the rubbish is just thrown away and left to rot in the street. Two young men decided they had had enough and it was time to do something about the problem in their hometown. So they gave up their jobs and started a trash collection and recycling business. Let's see this. It's five o'clock in the morning. As the sun rises, the stench of rotting garbage becomes unbearable. These two men are determined to do something about all the litter in their community, Macau. One solution is recycling, because most of, 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 of the things that we find here are recyclables. So 60% so of it can be redirected to, to recycling. Bongani Piri worked as a musician and Tabang Motiani worked in waste management. Seeing the garbage piling up, they both quit their jobs and started the initiative Vala Green. Like many villages in South Africa, Macau can't afford waste collection, so there's litter everywhere. The Vala Green team go from house to house to collect plastic, glass bottles and paper. Then they sort it all. Most people in Macau used to burn their waste, so it wasn't easy to convince them to change their ways and keep things that can be recycled. At first, only, only older women took us serious because they, they, do, they, do, they do recycling uh, themselves. So when we tell them about re uh, recycling, for them it's, it's, they understand it easier than telling a youth of uh, Macau about recycling. The two also started what they call the EcoHero program to engage with young people about environmental issues. Once a week, they go to the local primary school to make music and dance with the students. Participation is voluntary, but it's fun to join in. And that motivates the kids to become eco-heroes. The Valor Green team take what they collect to a recycling station. A major challenge for their business venture is transportation. The recycling station pays about 80 euros for a load. Half the sum goes to pay the owner of the truck. So Piri and Motiani earn just 300 euros a month in total. Piri says the solution is to grow the business and engage a large group of waste collectors who will sell them the things they find. So operating as a biplex center, so they come to us, they sell their recyclables, then we we take to these big companies who, who, who buy the end user, who buy recyclables. So the more volume we have, the more we're going to save on transport costs and labor costs. For now, Piri and Motiani are saving up to buy a professional weighing scale and eventually a truck of their own. Then they plan to employ dozens more waste collectors to make and keep Macau a clean place to live. In our series, Doing Your Bit, we always focus on great ideas and innovations. This week comes from Uganda. Sandra, tell us about it. 
Gladly, Niyote, the COVID-19 pandemic means that the healthcare resources are very stretched, so nobody really wants to get sick at a time like this. Infectious diseases like malaria are still a huge problem in many African countries. Mosquitoes spread malaria. Many people use chemicals to repel them, but a young man here in Uganda has come up with a new and safer way to keep the little pests away. Mosquitoes are tiny, but they can spread deadly diseases like malaria. Over 90% of malaria deaths around the world happen in Africa. Mosquito nets offer protection, but there might be another solution. Electrical engineer Julius Twine invented a more natural way to ward off the pesky bugs. In Africa, especially Uganda, we have some hubs, the hubs which have the smell that repel the mosquitoes. I collected hubs, like five of them. I mixed them under the shadow to maintain the smell. After collecting the herbs, he dries them and crushes them into a powder. He puts that powder into his battery-powered mosquito kit. When it's turned on, scented air flows out of these tiny holes. Twine says that mosquitoes don't like the smell, so they avoid the area. It has a range of 15 square meters, about the size of an average bedroom in Uganda. The device is powered by a built-in solar panel. Three hours of sun a week is enough to keep the battery charged. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Illegal logging? Farming and mining have been driving deforestation. But nowadays, where there is a problem, there is usually an app to help solve it. That is the case here too. An app for local people to monitor what is going on and report illegal logging. Protecting the trees could also benefit their communities. Let us see how it works. The man using this app wants to remain anonymous because his life would be in danger if the wrong people caught him collecting data here. He uses the app to report timber thieves who fell trees illegally in northwestern Ghana. We don't surprise these illegal loggers in the act because they're dangerous and armed. We only report their actions once they're gone. This teak tree, an endangered species, was felled illegally, sawn into pieces, and a large part of it was taken away. There must have been between five and ten men involved with heavy equipment. To track down the wood poachers, the NGO Nature and Development Foundation sends local observers into particularly affected areas across the country. The project is financed with EU support. The reports from the over 200 observers are collected at the organization's headquarters in the capital, Accra. Most of the alerts recorded on the platform indicate um, illegal chainsaw use to convert logs into lumber in situ at the sites where they are illegally logged. Based on this, um, the project has been able to identify some sites which have been relayed to the Forestry Commission for action to be taken. Douglas Adu Hayford is one of the monitors working for the organization. Today he's checking up on reported cases and documenting the damage. The timber thieves have not yet finished their work here. There is still wood waiting to be transported and even a canister of drinking water. This illegal chainsaw operation was on the ascendancy, but with the advent of the project, the illegality of Chainsaw operation happening in off-reserve area has been suppressed by the trainings and uh, capacity building programs which 
were, which were organized for community members and monitors. The timber trade is one of Ghana's most important industries. Tropical woods are sold all over the world. They include rare timbers that sell for high prices. John Bitar and Company is the largest timber processing firm in northwestern Ghana. It says it's committed to forest management certification. The label guarantees that wood products come from sustainably managed forests. Initially, there was a lot of resistance to the giant timber company here in the region, even though it pays a special wood tax that goes straight to communities. There was much friction between the company and the communities when we were about to, uh, to start the logging. There were instances where timber trucks loaded with timber would be blocked by, by, by the French communities. But right now with this EU NSA projects, there is the understanding between the industry, that's John Bita and company, and the forest French communities. The Nature and Deforestation Foundation not only works to prevent illegal deforestation, it also mediates between local people and industry. Resistance to the timber monopoly has eased, and instead there is more cooperation. In the village of Bedi, in the south of the country, residents are using taxes from the timber industry to build their own hospital. Every day, hundreds of timber transports from the region head for markets throughout the country to places like Ashaman, a suburb of Accra. In this big timber market, the origin of the wood is not checked too closely. But the head of the market association insists that the proportion of wood with a certificate of origin is on the rise. We have taken the timber as our business. So when there's no timber in the forest, we lost our business. So with that, it is protected. Then we can have it to sell every time. Things may be changing in Ghana's forestry sector, but there is still plenty to do for the local monitors, who make fresh discoveries of illegally felled trees almost every day. And now the bushmeat trade is the trapping and selling of wild animals for food. Now, it puts a lot of those that are already endangered in greater risk. But the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization says it is the second greatest threat after the loss of habitat. The trouble is, many people really like to eat bushmeat. In markets across Nigeria, you can find all kinds of forest creatures. Legal restrictions have not proved effective, nor have the public awareness campaigns managed to end the trade. At a major bush market in Nigeria's economic hub, Lagos, Pangolins, crocodiles and other endangered species are sold openly, available to anyone willing to pay the right price. We are selling it here. We are in Africa. This one is our business. We have been in this business for long. Bush meat is pricey and popular among wealthy Nigerians who pay between 25 and 60 euros for a crocodile. Small pangolins are sold at about 20 euros. Bush meat is better than chicken now, because I don't know how they preserve the chicken. But the, I, the bush meat, I will prepare it by myself. This lizard is sold alive. Chinedu Mogo buys it to bring to his animal sanctuary. So far, he has been able to buy 165 wild animals. If I don't buy them um, to, for my purpose, which is a, a fulfilling purpose, I believe, um, people will come and buy them for food. Um, and as you've seen most of these animals, they come in like this every day, dead. That you have continued hunting over time are reducing in number. Very soon they will be gone. That means you come here, you won't even see it anymore, even in, 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 real, in real life. So this is where culture must have its own limit. But the demand for bushmeat remains high in Nigeria. At this market, vendors sell 100 to 150 kilos of bushmeat per day on an average. The country is also an emerging transit hub for illegal wildlife trade. Tons of pangolin scales are shipped to Asia every year. Bush markets like this can also be a starting point for zoonotic diseases that are transmitted from animals to humans, like COVID-19. There are laws in Nigeria against trade in certain wildlife 
because these laws are not enforced. You cannot just pound some people, you have to educate the people first, so, and continue to do continuous education, then, of course, then the enforcement will follow later. Chinedu wants the teaching to start immediately, since there is not much time left. Among others, he saved a pangolin and a crocodile today. We have to prepare those coming up in the future um, so that they can, when they get there, they make purposeful decisions, policies that affect wildlife positively. The hope is that there will still be wildlife left in Nigeria by the time the next generation is able to act and continue Chinidu's fight. It looks like tighter regulations and enforcement are needed and of course alternative sources of income for those in the bushmeat trade. That's all for today. We hope you have enjoyed the show as much as we have bringing it to you. For more information, visit us on our social media platforms and our website. Goodbye from me, Neo Taigwe in Ibadan, or your state, Nigeria. Well, do join us once again next week for another edition of Eco Africa with more interesting stories about your environment. Thanks once again for joining us. I am Sandra Trinovia here in Kampala. It is a goodbye and please do take care of yourselves and the environment. No, oh, oh, oh.